Chaim Eisen didn't only major in Rabbinica, in Biblical Studies, but also in Philosophy and uh, Biophysics even. So, uh, I think we're privileged uh, to have him this uh, afternoon speak to us. Um, we asked to give a lecture on the Noahide Law uh, because it's embedded in the structure of the University of Amsterdam. <coughs> Actually, we are now, right now, in uh, uh, the teaching commitment on biblical theology and uh, uh, ethics. So we come across the Noahide Law. And uh, it's not only a covenant that God made with Noah, but he entrusted to him the precepts uh, the rules and regulations for all mankind. This is exactly what the Bible teaches. And Chaim will give some more explanation this afternoon. Uh, so feel free to ask questions, even to interrupt if necessary. How do we go about uh, this afternoon? Um, the first lecture will be on a survey of exegesis on the Noahide law. The second will start at 2 o'clock, and it will be on the meaning of these texts for theology. So what's the explanation uh, when it comes to theology? And the third lecture will start at 3 o'clock, and in the meanwhile, we'll have breaks for coffee. And the third lecture, he will give his own vision on the Noahide law and how it bridges the precepts of God between not only the Israelites, but also <laughs> the Gentile world. And this is very special. Um, so, um, let's give Chaim a hand, um, the floor is yours. So, indeed, as Professor Bakker expressed it, our subject is the Noachide Laws, and the first component of today will be the exegetical survey, which I must admit at the outset, is fraught with difficulty <laughs> because if you ask me well show me the verses the scriptural verses pertaining to Noahide laws well I'm sure you'll be able to surmise the answer to that after a much longer discussion but don't expect at any point in this discussion for me to actually answer that question directly <laughs> for reasons that will become clear where I would like to begin, however, is in Genesis. In Genesis, starting in chapter 4, and in particular, starting with the realization that, inevitably, chapter 4 comes right after chapter 3. <laughs> right after the sin of Adam and Eve and their banishment from the Garden of Eden. And as if that starting point in chapter 3 were not bad enough, we seem to move precipitously over the course of the succeeding verses from bad to much, much worse. So, we consider first the crime that is described in chapter 4, verse 8. And Cain spoke unto Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. The first act of murder. Murder, fratricide. And continuing in the same chapter, in verse 26, we read an admittedly ambiguous verse, exactly how to render it as I make clear in the presentation of the translation is a question. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enosh, the continuation, in the Hebrew, as Huchal Likro Beshem Hashem, could either be rendered, then began men to call upon the name of God, or alternatively to call others with the name of God. It was an act of initiative. They began, huchal in the Hebrew, but inevitably we associate two similar roots in Hebrew. The root, chalo, 
which pertains to initiating, and the root of chul, pertaining to profaning, lechalel. And to that extent, the initiative is an initiative that negates the original status quo of the world, which is, of course, inevitably, as expressed in Isaiah chapter 6, that the world is filled with the glory of God. To void that presence, to create, in Hebrew, halal, a hollow, an absence, an absence that then becomes filled with calling others in the name of God. So, we've progressed from murder to idolatry. And then, continuing in chapter 6, which admittedly is another enigmatic passage, we read from the beginning of the chapter, and came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, that daughters were born unto them, and the b'nei ha'elohim, another cryptic expression that in the translation may be rendered as sons of God, but perhaps better, more aptly in context and in conformance with the original Aramaic rendition of the text. The sons of the rulers or judges, the great ones, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took for themselves wives whomsoever they chose. And whomsoever they chose obviously accentuates that they were choosing on their own. It was not through any kind of subservience to any source, any authority, other than their own choices. And of course, inevitably, to the extent that we recognize that this third component pertains to marital relations, there is something having to do with sexuality here that, in, by implication in the text, is not positive. I call our attention to these three passages in the immediate aftermath of the sin of Adam and Eve, because, as undoubtedly you're all aware in our tradition, these three constitute the three cardinal sins of bloodshed, idolatry, and sexual immorality. And they're all there right at the outset. Now, let's consider how this becomes expressed, moving one step further down the road to the generation of Noah and the generation of the Flood. And in this regard, we focus in particular on the two-verse summary of the degeneracy, the depravity that that generation epitomized, verses 11 and 12, and the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Now, in explicating just what crimes are implicit in the text, I have to share with you that I recall the first time I presented this array of elucidation to an audience of Christian believers, I got something of the reaction of, aren't you being excessively picky and looking at the specifics of the words? To which, of course, my unhesitant response is, we are always picky with the Word of God. <laughs> we take everything seriously. Now, I do recognize that that becomes a particular challenge when people are accustomed to reading the Bible in translation, because you really can't examine a translated text with all of the subtleties and demands of exactitude that you would the original, but then we're not looking at the translation, we're looking at the original. And so we note that the word that is rendered as was corrupt is vatishachet, the first word of verse 11. And inevitably, in attempting to elucidate what that word connotes, what it signifies in context, we look for parallel appearance of the word. And I call your attention then to Deuteronomy chapter 4, God's warning, specifically with respect to idolatry. I'm reading verses 15 and 16. Take you therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of form on the day that God spoke unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, 
lest you deal corruptly and make you a graven image, even the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, and, and so on. The various alternative forms that alien service, serving anything other than God, can take. And of course we note that the Hebrew, pentash chitun, is but another conjugation of precisely the same root as vatishachet. Which leads us to understand then, again, not as an overt scriptural statement, but by exegetical implication. That the opening crime that is implicit in verse 11, very much apropos of what we saw in the generation of Enosh back in chapter 4, is a further degeneracy in the progression into idolatry and paganism. The continuation of the same verse, Vatimale Haaretz Hamas, inevitably demands of us the, expl the explication of what Hamas means. By the way, we aren't talking about an <coughs> Arabic word here, we're talking about Biblical Hebrew. The correspondence is uncanny, I admit, but I'm not making this up. Um, when we consider the senses in which Hamas appears elsewhere in the Bible, the connotation, I think, emerges as clear. I'm citing two examples here, from Isaiah chapter 59 and from Yonah chapter 3. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 6, their webs shall not become garments, neither shall men cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity. And the acts of violence, it's rendered here as violence, the Hebrew again, Hamas, same word, is in their, well, the translation reads in their hands, but I'm going to quibble over the precise text of the Hebrew. In their hands would be, be they hem. The Hebrew reads, bechapehem, which more properly should be rendered as, in their palms. Why quibble over these details? We see the same expression, practically precisely the same expression, in Yonah, chapter 8, where we read, chapter 3, verse 8, but let them be covered with sackcloth, instructs the king of Nineveh, both man and beast, and let them cry mightily unto God, yea, let them return every one from the easy evil way, and from the violence, again, Hamas in the Hebrew, that is in their, well, again, rendered as hands, but the Hebrew reads, once again, Bechapehem, in their palms. Now, why am I quibbling over in their palms? Because while hands can have a much more general implication, in their palms is what you take. And the implication then in our tradition is this is stealing. That Hamas, while again reasonably rendered into English here as violence, carries the particular connotation of theft, larceny. We'll return to why that is relevant specifically here in a moment. But before we do, we consider verse 12. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Now here, I defer not to cross-referencing, but simply to the implication of the text itself in speaking of all flesh. And to that extent, then, sins of the flesh, carnal sins, the sin of sexual immorality. Note the correspondence between the sins that are then implicit in the description of the generation of Noah and the sins that we already referenced in the aftermath of the sin of Adam and Eve. Of course, you will immediately note that the correspondence is imperfect. We have identified the implicit succumbing to the temptation of idolatry, and of sexual immorality, but of course, what was manifest immediately after the sin of Adam and Eve was the fratricidal murder of Abel by Cain, and there isn't any statement that pertains to a society that is overrun by murder in the time of Noah. Uh, but then, and this is admittedly an idea that is expressed by one of the great 
Bible scholars, Jewish thinkers of the 16th century, Rabbi Judah Leva of Prague, also known as the Maharal, that uh, you can't really have a society that is overrun by murder, by definition. A society that is overrun by murder will immediately self-destruct. But in essence, a society that is overrun by theft is similar, in that the ultimate act of taking from another, obviously, is taking a life. Taking one's property is not synonymous by any means, but it is evocative of the same mentality, the same attitude with respect to the world. So while, admittedly, this is not a portrayal of cardinal sins, it is nonetheless a portrayal of an undoing of society on these three levels, three levels, the nature of which I'd like to return to consider a bit later. But for now, perhaps we should just sit here contemplating, soaking in this utterly depressing <laughs> description of a trajectory of the world as it steadily progresses from bad to worse with seemingly no possible positive dimension to discern anywhere on the landscape, except there is. There is here manifestly expressed a crucial theme that is ultimately the greatest boost to our spirits, the greatest inspiration with respect to what lies ahead. And it's expressed in, admittedly, just two words, at least two words in the Hebrew, three in the English, and um, considering that the, it is the only set of words that is highlighted on the page to which I have not yet called our attention, their identity should be self-evident. In the Hebrew, Vayar Elohim, God saw. God saw. The world is not merely a scene of chaos, of degeneracy, of depravity. Rather, when we encounter that expression, Vayar Elohim, God saw, we, after all, cannot help but immediately make the association with the manner in which that self-same expression verbatim appears in the first chapter of Genesis, and appears indeed repeatedly, as noted here. And not merely that God saw, but what did God see repeatedly in the description of creation in Genesis chapter 1? He saw whatever is the object of the verse in context, he saw that it was good. Beginning, of course, the first case in verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good, and of course the progression continues. I'm not going to belabor the point with the references, but we see the expression of it was good over and over again. Verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, verse 17, and 18, verse 21, verse 25, and finally, after the creation of man, in verse 31, the ultimate culmination of this progression, and God saw all that he had made, all that he had done, and behold, it was very good. Yes? May I ask a question? Please. Yeah. Um, when you list these three cardinal sins, um, murder, adultery, and sexual um, immorality, is it intentionally that you exclude the uh, disobedience uh, that, that is described in uh, Genesis 2? You mean, Genesis, the, 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 you mean it's the sin of Adam and Eve? Yeah, as, as a sin of uh, disobedience. The, the sin of Adam and Eve I would regard more as an archetype a template that pertains to all sin that follows. It isn't something that it's can be categorized as a particular wrongdoing. It is indeed the basis of the transformation that takes place in the human condition consequent to the sin. I, I will stress, and of course I'm sure you all realize, that understanding the nature of the sin and its consequences and the biting impact is a domain of somewhat critical divergence between Judaism and Christianity. And I'm not addressing that either right now. Uh, but that is, from a Jewish perspective, we don't regard 
the sin of Adam and Eve as resulting in a curse of man because after the sin takes place in chapter 3, there are, after all, three accomplices in the crime and how many are cursed? Who are the three? The three are, after all, the text, you know, Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve. And Adam, snake. Eve, snake. Okay, how many are cursed? Three. How many are cursed? Get out your Bibles. How many are cursed? Hmm? <laughs> just, a just, a, just a snake. The earth is cursed because of man, but man is not cursed. The human condition is transformed and Adam and Eve are banished from paradise, and they will, moreover, bear the consequences of the transformation attendant to eating of the tree of knowing good and evil from functioning as perceptive beings to functioning as creative beings, and this would be a fascinating discussion, except it would take us much too far afield, but um, while they did sin, and that transformation does take place, it isn't described as a curse, it is, if anything, I would say, described in chapter 3, verse 23, Vayeshalachehu, as being sent on a mission. But in any case, it is a mission that precipitates the gamut of this worldly existence, so we're not talking about that. That is, that's something that is, I would say, proto-world. It is, in itself, the meridian that separates the, what I would describe, anti-tree world from the post-tree world. We're focusing post-tree here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> post-tree. <laughs> okay, but, uh, but returning now again to the implications of God saw. Of course, inevitably, uh, this is, I'm sure, uh, self-evident to us all that we cannot possibly understand God saw that it was good in the manner that we might, were we reading the text, say, on the level of what I would describe as nursery school theology, um, presume that the artisan makes the masterpiece and then takes a couple of steps backward to look at it inside. Is it what I wanted? Is it not what I wanted? Did it work out the way I had hoped it would work out? Obviously, such a metaphor would be not only inappropriate, but downright heretical with respect to God. There isn't any need to clarify. Rather, when we read that God saw, first of all, what that indicates on the most basic plane is that the relationship between God and that which he creates does not terminate in creation. It is after that which has come into existence has come into existence that it is described as the object of God seeing. In other words, that the relationship is enduring, if you will, apropos of, if I may so, be so blunt as to say, the heresy of deism, we do not regard God as creating and abandoning. God saw. And moreover, that God judges. God saw that it was good. In other words, that there is an ongoing relationship and an ongoing evaluation. God is not, if you will, the disinterested party that merely observes from the sidelines. God evaluates. God judges. God deems that it is good. Obviously, in the generation of Noah, what God saw was not good. But that God saw is in itself perhaps the most uplifting, most inspiring, most comforting observation that we can make with respect to this period. That the consequence of this degeneracy is not that the world has simply become a degenerate place and has abandoned God and been abandoned by God because even to the extent that the world may have abandoned God, God does not abandon the world. God saw. And this, of course, in particular, 
is significant when we consider the implications with respect to that final creation in Genesis chapter 1, human beings. Who are, of course, obviously, in chapter 6, the principal subject of the degeneracy and the depravity that is the subject of the indictment that we read in those verses. When we consider what renders that final creation, humanity, unique, I'm focusing upon a common theme that we observe in chapter 1, in chapter 5, and in chapter 9 of Genesis. When God creates man, verses 26 and 27, God said, let us make man, in the Hebrew it is, bitsalmenu chidimutenu. The translation here renders salmenu as in our image. Perhaps a better translation would be with our essence. And kidmuteno, our likeness, likeness of the essence. Obviously, we aren't speaking of a physical form. But there is something unique that pertains to the human condition that bears a divine likeness that nothing else in creation can possibly emulate. And in the following four verse, indeed, we read that God created man in his own image, or again, we may prefer essence, in the image, again, essence of God, created he him. That man is dowered with this unique element of the divine, an element that is perhaps most aptly, vividly summarized at the beginning of chapter 5, a summation. This is the book of the generations of man. One could render it as, a, as Adam, but really fundamentally the generations of man, of humanity. And what is the message of this book? In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. I feel compelled to share with you that um, in our tradition there is a debate over which verse in the Torah more than any other signifies the essence of the entire Torah, which is the klal gadol, the great generality under which everything in the Torah is subsumed. And one of the answers offered by the rabbis to that question is Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. And I think it's important for us to appreciate the implications, in particular with respect to our discussion. Of course, I'm sure none of you have missed the fact that I haven't addressed the exegesis of the seven Noachide laws at all yet. And you're still going to have to be patient. But um, what I'll note for our purposes is that to regard Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, as the essential principle, the great generality under which the entire Torah is subsumed is at first brush a baffling statement because in as much as we recognize after all that Torah is presenting to us a way of life, a set of prescriptions, in Genesis chapter 5 verse 1 is purely descriptive. It isn't prescriptive. But then, realizing, as I'm sure you're all well aware, that one of the worst travesties of translation is the commonplace rendering of Torah, as I find it in most translations, to my consternation, as law, which it clearly does not mean, because there are a number of words in Hebrew that mean law, and that is not one of them. Once we recognize that what Torah means is, of course, you know, teaching. Teaching. So teaching can be both prescript and descriptive. And this, while overtly functioning as a descriptive statement, clearly has critical prescriptive implications. 
Because once you recognize that you are created with a divine likeness implanted within you, imprinted upon you, that has implications with respect to how you're going to live your life. Which becomes most explicitly articulated in the third selection on the page here, which is while a descriptive statement, a descriptive statement that is intended to explain an explicitly prescriptive statement, whosoever sheds man's blood, we read in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, by man shall his blood be shed. Capital punishment for shedding blood, for murder. Why? For in the image of God made he man. That is, once you recognize that you are created with divine likeness, once you recognize your fellow man is created with divine likeness, that imposes upon you responsibilities. It imposes upon your responsibilities, I would submit, doubly. That is, both the responsibility to treat with respect and reverence the God-likeness that is in your fellow man, and moreover, perhaps even more essentially, to treat with reverence the God-likeness that is within you, and that imposes responsibilities upon you insofar as how you behave, how you conduct yourself. And I'm stressing this, of course, because, again, while we haven't said anything at all yet about the Noachide laws, what we do recognize in this dynamism is what I submit is the critical message emergent from what God teaches us through these opening chapters of Genesis. The relationship is enduring, God sees. And moreover, the relationship imposes responsibilities that it is good, there is evaluation, there is judgment. And in particular, as those beings endowed with that divine likeness, the responsibility placed upon us as humanity is the most acute. And of course, by consequence, inevitably, the implications of the degeneracy that takes place in the human condition are the most dire. Now, when we consider where that leads us, we consider at long last, although I suspect this may be mightily anticlimactic, the verse that in our tradition serves as the exegetical foundation for the Noahide Covenant. It is indeed what we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, and following. And of course, you would undoubtedly note quite immediately that there isn't any reference here at all with respect to any of the Noahide laws, which of course appear on the list before you on the pages that have been already distributed. The truth is, I could share with you the particular homilies that are hermeneutically associated with the words of the verse, but um, I would be hard-pressed to defend any kind of a literal association between those words and the Noahide laws to you, especially because I'm not particularly convinced that they are in any direct manner associated with the words of the verse themselves, even on my own part. What I would stress, however, with respect to Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, and I think this really is the foundation of our understanding of the Noachad Covenant, is one critical foundation that unambiguously is indeed stated in chapter 2, verse 16. It's not specific with respect to the Noachad Covenant. It is simply the realization inviolably, Vaitzav, God commanded. Only human beings are the object of the divine command. Granted, the rest of the world is the object of the divine utterance that calls everything that exists into existence. Yeah, but still, to be able to receive a divine command demands of you 
having that God likeness imprinted upon you that serves as the enabler of hearing the command of God in the first place and in the second place being able to respond to it. The capacity to choose. The capacity to understand the implications of the command and the choice that it presupposes and choose whether to submit to the divine command or to violate it. And of course, inevitably, it is in that vein that we can well appreciate what God says to Noah and his progeny after the flood, after emerging from the ark. We read in chapter 9, of course, of God's blessing to Noah, and it is indeed expressed as a blessing, beginning with the words, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And what then follows as an extension of the blessing is the unique status that is accorded to huma humanity. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all wherewith the ground teems and upon all the fish of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be for food for you as the green herb I have given you all. There is a supremacy accorded to the human being. A human being is not merely quantitatively more sophisticated than the beast. God teaches us that the human being is qualitatively distinct from the beast. And yet, that doesn't provide any sort of a carte blanche to do what you will with the world. And immediately after these words, we encounter the imperatives. First, in verse 4, only flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. You are allowed to eat flesh. You are allowed to eat animals. You are not allowed to eat animals however way you please. You are not permitted to eat an animal or any limb of an animal that is torn from it while alive. This at the very least provides us with some connection to the Noahide laws, as you may note, albeit a scanty one. And we continue in verse 5 and verse 6, and surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, even at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man, who so sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. The capital punishment imposed on murder, and again, of course, we saw this verse earlier, for in the image of God made he man. And, of course, the continuation, the promise, and you be you fruitful and multiply swarm in the earth and multiply therein but we do have here the imperatives in other words when we consider structurally what god is telling man in these verses at the beginning of chapter 9 on the one hand there is the blessing there is the promise there is the unique status accorded to man which of course we could say is the gift but to use the English idiom, it is a gift with strings attached. There are responsibilities imposed. There is the gift, there are the responsibilities. Because of your uniqueness, because of the unique status accorded to you as human beings, there are responsibilities imposed upon you, and in essence, conceptually, derivative of that opening volley back in chapter 2, God commands, and he commands only man, God commands you to obey the mandates that he has given you as the crucial partner, the association with the gift, the unique status that he accords to man. Now there is, of course, in this regard, one additional theme that we should stress in the continuation of chapter 9, and that is what is overtly articulated as the covenant. Except, of course, were we to seek in the covenant 
the exegetical source of the Noachide laws, you would obviously note to your great consternation that in the covenant, there's no imperative at all. What is the covenant? If anything, the covenant seems to be something that exclusively binds God. We read from verse 8 and on, And God spoke unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the fowl, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, and of all that go out of the ark, even every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And on some plate, of course, we look at this and say, this is a very strange covenant. It seems like a completely one-sided obligation. And overtly, as stated here, it is. There's no way of avoiding that. God has obligated himself to not destroy all flesh ever again. The covenant, as stated, doesn't seem to obligate us at all. Except, I would stress on two planes that inevitably it does. In the first instance, simply the realization that a covenant is definitionally a two-way street. So while God is articulating his side of the deal, there must necessarily be a consequent obligation that humanity takes upon itself as a response to the covenant that God has established. Well, what is that other component? And of course, inevitably, my response is, we go back to the first part of the chapter. And recognizing that the antecedent of the covenant is the obligations that God imposes upon man. Recognizing that, we appreciate that there is indeed a set of obligations that we can well describe. I didn't say scripturally prove. I said well describe <laughs> as the Noahide covenant with its implications and obligations. Well, that provides the basis as such for the exegesis. Um, I don't know if we should continue now with considering the commandments themselves per se, or if it would be more appropriate to take a, a short recess and continu continue with the tabular format that of course appears over here, yes, let's a greater length. Have a short break. Are okay. You, are there any questions? Please. Yes. Yeah. I have a question about. Um, you said after the sin of Adam and Eve, there was no uh, curse, but uh, they were sent on a mission. Is it in um, chapter three, verse twenty-three? Is it in um, uh, rabbinic uh, exegesis also connected to the first commandment that you have to spread, uh, multiply, and spread? Among well, that, that, after all, is the, um, the imperative that God states at the outset before there was any sin. Yeah. What I would stress here, I, I realize this takes us a little bit far afield, so I'll, I'll try to encapsulate it briefly, is when you consider chapter 3, verses 22 and 24. Maybe I shouldn't have given you the, uh, uh, the punchline by telling you that I'm citing those two verses. Because if we juxtapose those two verses to one another, that is, that God says, Behold, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now lest man take of the tree of life and eat of it and live forever. And of course, we add parenthetically, and that would be the, the worst conceivable tragedy of living forever in an unredeemed state. So therefore, God banished man from the Garden of Eden and placed at the entrance of the Garden the revolving sword to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Which, of course, as a succession makes perfect sense. And I suspect that if I wouldn't have given you the punchline in advance and asked you, what did I just do that was a fraud? You might not have even given me the answer because I was speaking with a very eminent theologian yesterday and I gave him the riddle and he failed. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, I left out verse 23. 
Verse 24 seems like a perfectly coherent continuation of verse 22. Well, what happened to verse 23? And inevitably, when we consider the content of verse 23, I think it is intended specifically to interpose between what God says in verse 22 and the banishment of Adam and Eve from the garden. Because if verse 24 would indeed follow on the heels of verse 22, our inevitable conclusion would be it's just punishment, it is banishment, it is nemesis. But before you get to verse 24, uh, God sent man forth from the garden to work the earth from which he had been taken. You have a mission now, go get to work. And when one considers what the punishments were of Adam and Eve, again, this is a longer discussion than we can encapsulate in a couple of minutes, but in brief, what is the ultimate creative act in which a human being to be more precise, in which some human beings can engage. Having a baby. Having a baby. Yeah. Only some human beings can do that. So um, after having eaten of the tree of knowing good and evil and, evil and choosing to become a creative being, God says to Eve, okay, you want to be creative, you're going to be creative with all the anguish and difficulty that is attendant to being creative. And then there are the other human beings who can't engage in the ultimate creative act. And for them, what's second best? What's the best they can do as creative beings? To coax sustenance from a recalcitrant earth. <coughs> that's also a creative act. And that's also going to be fraught with difficulty because you'll be sprouting briars and thistles. But you wanted to be creative. Okay, just realize what package you just took. You'll, you'll have to deal with all the con consequences now of becoming creative. Okay, you're being sent on a mission, now get to work. Now, I should stress, because you might be wondering, am I implying, therefore, that there wasn't any punishment? No, of course there's a punishment. There's no question it's a punishment. But, it's the punishment of a loving father who never abandons his children and never entirely casts them away. It's a mission. But were they able to fulfill the first uh, commandment if they stayed in the Garden of Eden? That's an excellent question, which of course I can't really formally answer because I wasn't there. But, um, but I will note as perhaps a subtle allusion to the answer that the beginning of chapter 4, and this is a subtlety that doesn't get preserved in translation. The beginning of chapter 4 in speaking of man knowing his wife carnally, uh, does not use what is the more common conjugation in Biblical Hebrew, which is what we call in Hebrew vav ha'ipuch, the conversive vav that employs a future tense conjugation with the vav conjunctive before the verb that implies that the future tense is converted into past tense. For those who are familiar with Biblical Hebrew, you undoubtedly understand what I mean by that. For those who don't, I think it would take too long to explain right now. But in any case, that's not the format that's used in chapter 4, verse 1. It is not Vayeda ha'adam et chava'ishto, but v'adam yada et chava'ishto. That is, it's using the simple past tense which in our tradition implies that this is something that had taken place earlier. In other words, it, it, it was antecedent to the sin. Because sexuality is not something that was born in sin. Sexuality is something that pertained to the Garden of Eden as well. But not as it becomes uh, fraught with the angst and pain of creativity in our creative post-treat world. But I think I've said too much already. <laughs> yes. Just one, one question before the break. Uh, you said that um, uh, mankind is not cursed, as Christians sometimes used to say. But what's your consideration on the Yetzer Hara'ah, which is used, of course, in the description of mankind in, I think, the eighth chapter? Mm -hmm. uh, what's what's Yetzer Hara'ah, according to you? Okay, just first to uh, provide translation for the benefit 
of the non-Hebrew experts. The expression Yetzer Hara is indeed a Talmudic term, but it is based upon the expression that we find in Genesis chapter 6, um, that God says, Yetzer Lev Hadam Ra, Mina Urav, that the Yetzer, which could probably best be rendered as drive or inclination of man is evil from his youth, which obviously does imply a mighty challenge with which man must contend. And yet, of course, simultaneously, it is by implication precisely with that challenge that God addresses Cain when Cain is distraught over his offering not having been accepted. And God says to him, that if you don't improve your ways, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is towards you. But you will rule over it. If you choose, you will rule over it. There is an alternative understanding, a kind of nuance of translation that ve'elecha teshukato ve'atatim sholbo should better be rendered as and um, its desire is that you rule over it. Mm. That is temptation that wants to be defeated. But it is the temptation that is given you by God as the challenge. The challenge of evil, of is sin crouching at the door. Is that possible, do you think? Sorry? Is that translation plausible? The question is how we understand the conjunctive vav, which, in, which indeed has multiple nuances of meaning in, yeah. in Biblical Hebrew. Yeah. That is, um, it, it, it is a much more versatile conjunction in Biblical Hebrew than in post-Biblical Hebrew. Okay. So it is possible. <laughs> okay. but, but then I'll, I'll say that um, this is something that we can choose to appropriate in however way we please, which is why in traditional Talmudic ex exegesis, where heart is expressed in the Bible instead of as lev, as levav, with a doubling of the bet, such as in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you shall love God your Lord, bechol levavecha, not libcha, with all of your levav, the, the, the Talmudic interpretation is with both of your yetzarim, your drive towards good and your drive towards evil. Great. They both are means to loving God. Thank you. Okay.